Welcome to Distressed to Joyful, Bailey's Way. I'm your host, Bailey Raber, here to enlighten you and the rest of the world about one of the most misunderstood mental health disorders out there, bipolar disorder. In each episode, we'll learn more about my personal journey with bipolar 2 disorder, how I've struggled with it, and how I've learned to overcome those struggles. Together, we'll laugh, we'll cry, and most importantly, we'll have fun. You'll leave each episode feeling hopeful and stocked full of useful information on how you can better yourself and the world around you. Hello, friends. Wow, zuh, it has been a minute. And to be honest, I really should have just announced that that I was going to take a break for the summer <laughs> when I last released an episode, which as most of you probably know, especially if you've been tuning in regularly up until recently, <laughs> that that was two months ago. So for those of you who are here today, dude, thank you. I super appreciate you sticking around and, you know, just being here with all the ups and downs. I have tried so hard to be consistent, but Yet again, bipolar disorder is anything but consistent, and it has gotten in the way sometimes. Although this time, it was not at all bipolar disorder that got in the way. It was instead the fact that my partner and I were traveling a lot this summer. So I do want to apologize, though, for just kind of disappearing again and for saying I was cutting down when I really, like I said, should have just told you guys I was going to take a break. I have this really um, bad habit that I struggle with when thinking I can just do everything. (laughs) I tend to think I'm superwoman and I can get it all done. And a lot of the times I can. I do have a lot of high energy. I do attest a lot of that to the, you know, the upper side of bipolar disorder. But this summer I was clearly wrong and I did not have a chance to record like I was hoping to. So as for our travels, we actually spent some time in Chicago back in the beginning of June. We got to meet our first nephew in the family, which was really, really cool. So we are officially a mama and mommy, which that in Hindi is uncle and uncle's wife. So real quick, fun fact, in Hindi, all of the family relations have different names. So like, you know, in English, we just have uncle and aunt, and we have that on both sides of the family. Or in, you know, Latino cultures, they have Tio and Tia, right? Well, in Hindi families, or excuse me, in Indian families, and specifically using the Hindi language, we have different names for different family members on different sides. So, (laughs) because it was Monish's girl cousin who had a baby, we are considered, that's considered like her brother. So, that's mother's brother. So, that's mama is mother's brother, to the baby. And then that's how I'm mommy because I'm the wife of mother's brother. It sounds a little confusing. And if you're not part of the culture, it is really confusing. But for me, somebody who has been, you know, sucked in and fully immersed for the last four and a half years, I love it. It makes it so much easier to understand who we're talking about, which side of the family, um, that kind of thing. So Super cool. That's super lots of info. (laughs) But I hope that you found that fun. Some people love to hear these little quirky things. So yeah, we got to do that to Chicago, which is fun. And we, of course, did the touristy stuff while we were there. Uh, We spent a week in Washington, D.C. slash Virginia slash (laughs) Maryland. We were in all of those areas. It was actually during 4th of July, which was super cool. So we got to actually experience... The 4th of July fireworks on the National Mall in D.C., which up until now I didn't know was a bucket list item. (laughs) So I got to check that off my bucket list as soon as I put it on, which was super cool. Um, We also did some hiking up there. We went to Shenandoah National Park. We went and saw all of, of course, the monuments and memorials throughout Washington, D.C., But the whole reason for our trip was because on Moni's other side of the family, he has another girl cousin who is pregnant. So we went up there and we were there for her baby shower, which fun fact, um, in Indian baby showers, there is dancing and performances just like in Indian weddings. So while we were there, we performed a dance at the baby shower, which was super, super fun. 
So that is on my YouTube. I'm going to put the link in the show notes in case you want to see it. It's like two minutes long. But that has been something I've really enjoyed about Indian culture is all of the dance. It's I just love it. It's so fun. So we also actually this week just got back from vacationing in Europe. It was so much fun. We went to Germany and then we went back to the Netherlands, specifically to Amsterdam again. I have not got to my first round of Amsterdam in Travel Tales yet, but don't you worry because more Travel Tales episodes are coming soon. Although, I'm going to be very transparent. They're going to be super random. They're probably not even going to be on Mondays. I'm just going to release them whenever I can. So think of Travel Tales as bonus episodes that are just going to pop up whenever they pop up. And for those of you who love listening to those, uh, get excited and make sure that you are subscribed to Distress the Joyful Bailey's Way on whichever listening platform you prefer. That way you can stay up to date when these episodes get released because again, it's going to be at random. (laughs) And I'm mainly doing that because like I said, I've not been very consistent and I don't want to lie to you guys. Um, Something that's really important to me is... You know, when I make a promise or when I say I'm going to do something, it's really important to me to keep that. And so the fact that I've broken that a couple times this year, I get down on myself about it, which is something I know I need to work on. So that's why I'm trying to make less promises and just give more generalized so we don't have issues. Well, we don't have issues, so I don't have issues. And also, so you guys aren't let down either, because that's the last thing I want to do is let you guys down. So, that said, before we dive into the episode, I do have a little self-reflection corner I want to share with y'all. This one is really, really interesting, and I realized this right before we went to Europe. And what I learned about myself recently is that I no longer feel joy when buying things. So if you're a longtime listener and you've been listening from at least season two, you may remember that I have an episode in season two, it's episode 12, and it's titled Manic Spending Sprees. And within that episode, I go into detail about how I used to just spend money like crazy and I used it as a coping, like a coping mechanism to where I would spend money and I would, you know, get that dopamine hit and I would feel that little bit of joy because I bought the new purse or I got these shoes or I bought this makeup that's going to make me look pretty. But eventually it wears off and then I don't have money and then I can't pay my bills and it became a really bad cycle of spending habits that were just wrecking my life. (laughs) And so back then, you know, I would get joy from buying shit. That was what kept me going with all of that. But I realized recently that's no longer the case. I don't need to spend money to feel joy. I have found joy in so many other areas of my life. From dancing with Moni, for exercise, hanging with my friends, sewing, being here with you guys. I have found so many other ways to feel joy that, yeah, sometimes I do feel joy when buying things, but it's no longer something that I search for and that I go after and that I need. It's just... You know, occasionally I'll spend money on something nice for myself and feel great, but I I don't desire that anymore. I really don't. So pat on my back because that is huge that I have overcome something that used to be such a problem. <laughs> so I'm sharing this in my self-reflection corner because I want to inspire any of you guys listening who might have really bad habits with overspending because, hey, I've been there. Tune into Manic Spending Sprees if you haven't already to learn more about those issues that I had and what I did to work on overcoming those. I am just so grateful that I was able to overcome that, but you can too. That's the thing. You just have to work towards it. You just have to want it bad enough and to work towards it. And if I can do it, you can do it. So again, I hope that this is inspiring and that you find some motivation within this, especially if you're someone who needs it. Let's go ahead and dive into today's episode, which is understanding and overcoming shame, insights, strategies, and personal stories. 
So I found a beautiful definition of shame in an article titled The Psychology of Shame written by Arlen Kunick on VeryWellMind.com. And this definition states that shame is a feeling of embarrassment or humiliation that arises from the perception of having done something dishonorable, immoral, or improper. They go on to say that people who experience shame usually hide the thing that they feel ashamed of. So when shame is chronic, it can involve the feeling that you are fundamentally flawed. Shame can often be hard to identify in oneself. So while shame is a negative emotion, its origins play a part in our survival as a species. Without shame, we might not feel the need to adhere to cultural norms, to follow laws, or behave in a way that allows us to exist as social beings. So we need shame, but shame can also be very problematic, and it can cause issues, and it can take over our lives. So let's talk about the categories of shame. In this article on VeryWellMind.com, the one I just referred to, they list a ton of different types of shame. A ton. But I don't really have time to get into all of them. (laughs) So I encourage you to read the full article yourself, though. So you'll be able to find it in today's show notes and head on over there and check it out and get the full scoop yourself. But... What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the three core themes of shame that have been categorized by Brene Brown, and those three things are as follows. Body image and health, that's one. Relationships and social status. So is anyone surprised that these are the three core themes of shame? meaning that these are the three areas of shame that people are most wrapped up in because I sure as hell am not surprised (laughs) because I will tell you right now that I have 100% felt shame in all of these categories and many different times of my life. And you know, you probably have too. (laughs) Let's be real, you probably have too. So let's talk about some examples of shame that could be felt within each category. And so before we jump into all of those, I do want to make it clear that what drives shame and what makes those feelings arrive is you arrive. What makes the feelings of shame arise are typically fear and it's fear of something else. So that said, within the body image and health category, The fear of not having a fit enough body or not being strong enough, or there's a fear of being overweight or too underweight, or the fear of not being pretty enough or smart enough. All of these fears will drive shame. They will bring shame up to the surface and shame will start to control you and it's not going to be fun and it's not going to be pretty. And I know this because I've been there many a times myself. So within the relationship category, the fear of not being worthy of love, the fear of not being connected enough, and the fear of not being respected by others. So those are just a few examples of what could drive shame in that area. And then lastly, there's social status. So this one could be the fear of not having enough money, the fear of not wearing the right clothes. So things like just not expensive enough clothes, not trendy enough, not cool enough, whatever. And then the fear of being judged on your career or on your college education or lack thereof. So again, all of these fears will drive shame within this category of life. So I have felt every single one of these that I have listed. All of these examples are examples from my personal life too. (laughs) But it would probably take me at least 24 hours of straight talking to get through all of these with you. So instead, I just want to focus on one specific category, and that is relationships. So why am I picking this category specifically? I'm sure a lot of you probably would have assumed I would have picked body image and health. (laughs) And that one, holy moly, we will get to that on another day because that is... 
that's a topic that's a deep dive and that is one that is sensitive. So we will get there eventually, but today I want to focus on relationships. And that is because first I want to point out that Brene Brown's research has found that most people only have about one to three true friends that they could actually count on for anything. So when I say that they could count on for anything, that they could call them up and say, hey, I need you to watch my dog while I'm out of town. Or, hey, can you help me move into my new house? Or, hey, I am running late from work. I have to stay an extra hour. Could you pick up my kids from daycare for me, please? I don't have anyone else. So to me, this statistic is absolutely nuts. This is the research that shows one to three people. That's it. That's on average how many true friends people have. But, y'all, when I look back on my life, there are lots of periods within my life where I fell into that category, where I could only think of one or two people that I could call on if I really truly needed help. So thankfully, I've done a lot of work over the years, and I have cultivated many, many people many pure and true friendships that I hold dear to my heart. To name a few people, Keith, Victor, Maddie, I mean, Luis, I could keep going on. Like, I am so, so grateful for the community that I have. But guys, that's the thing is that I've built these. It's taken work. Real quick, I do want to just point out that if any of you guys are listening and you're like, okay, how have you built these friendships? How have you cultivated strong relationships with people that you can call on, that you can get help from if necessary? I will tell you, but I need at least 10 people to be interested in the topic and then I will create an entire episode devoted to how I was able to cultivate strong bonds and true friendships of where we can count on each other within so many different people. Guys, I just listed four names. I could keep going. I've got Renee and Derek and Kevin and Sapan and Viva and I could keep going, but I'm not going to. <laughs> so instead, if you are on YouTube, drop a comment and say something about friendship. Say the word friendship and I get 10 of those, we'll make an episode. If you're not listening on YouTube, then DM me on Instagram at distressed to joyful underscore Bailey's way. All you have to do is say friendship, and I'm going to know exactly what you're talking about, and I'm going to tally it up. And if I get 10 of them, we'll do an episode, y'all, okay? I promise. This is a promise I will keep as long as you guys do your part. How about that? (laughs) Okay, so the second reason that I chose this category is because relationships are fucking hard, y'all. They are difficult, and they take work. Like I said, cultivating all these friendships, it took work. And in my opinion, I think that nowadays, a lot of people, instead of, you know, facing confrontation head on, or if there's a disagreement that arises, instead of leaning into the discomfort and being vulnerable and facing the problem and talking it out and working it out with our friends, I think a lot of people nowadays just decide to call it quits, or they decide to just say, fuck it, and ghost the person, or whatever. And I blame, I blame the internet, 100%. And I also blame this world of convenience and this social media. Because social media has given a lot of us an idea of, we have all these friendships, right, with people on social media. But that will not compete with friendships in real life. And I'm also guilty, y'all, of saying fuck it to some friendships because in the past, I was not willing to lean into the discomfort and the vulnerability of confronting someone and trying to talk things out. So nowadays, I have no fucking problem. Some of y'all listening know this. You have sat there with me when I pulled out my journal and I had thoughtfully written out what I want to say and that how I want to move forward with fixing and, you know, reconciling a friendship because friendships are so important to me. But things didn't used to be like that. I used to just say fuck it and dip out. 
And I think a lot of people nowadays choose to do that, which is why I think that the research has found that most people have very few people they can count on. So that is why I wanted to jump into relationships. And lastly, I've chosen this category because out of the three of them, this is one that I still struggle with the most today. And specifically in the realm of shame, which is the topic here, right? So shame and relationships. Let me tell you a recent experience where I felt shame in my relationship with my friends, and it's a group of them. And let me tell you how that affected me and what all occurred. So roughly two months ago, I had planned a semi-last minute pool party at my apartment complex, and I invited a handful of friends. And we were excited. We were going to do a build your own taco bar. I was getting people set up on who's going to bring what. So that way I didn't have to provide all the food. And so everything was great. Everything was covered. People were coming. It was going to be so much fun. But Moni and I got into a pretty big fight on Saturday. And Unfortunately, it spilled over into Sunday, and this pool party was supposed to be on a Sunday. So we got in a really, really big fight on Sunday, and about two to three hours before people were supposed to come over for the pool party, I realized I did not have the emotional capacity for it. I was completely drained. And I was exhausted from fighting with Moni. And I'm like, I can't do this. I can't have people over right now. And so I canceled. I canceled this two to three hours before it was supposed to happen. And I felt really, really bad. And I told everybody it was for personal reasons. And I didn't go into details. And this is completely out of character for me, you guys. I'm a planner. I plan shit. And I follow through. And so... The fact that I didn't follow through with what I said I was going to do and I canceled on people, I didn't just feel bad. I felt like I let people down and I felt embarrassed and I felt ashamed. And I also felt like I couldn't tell people what was really going on because I was also ashamed of that. I was ashamed that I was fighting with my partner, Moni, who I love dearly and I hate when we fight. (laughs) So I ended up going into recluse mode and recluse mode is a term coined by both me and my therapist. So it's a combo of her words and mine. And it is when I pull away from people. And this typically occurs when I am feeling negative emotions about myself. If I'm feeling depressed, if I'm beating myself up, if I'm like having a really bad time with body image anything like that, I will pull away from my friends. And so because I canceled things last minute and I felt embarrassed for doing that, I felt like I was a bad person because I let everybody down because I didn't follow through with what I said I was going to do and that this was supposed to be a fun day and now I feel like I ruined the day for everybody. I pulled back. I felt like I didn't want to be involved with my friends because I was ashamed. Because shame came over and took the control panel and just started driving. And it was shitty and it sucked. So I ended up not opening text messages from these friends for a couple of days. My friend Jack texted me to check in on me to see that I was okay. So did Victor. So did Renee. And it took me days to open up their texts and respond to them because I was just in a shame storm. And... The problem with this is that I really needed my friends in that moment. I really needed them because I was dealing with a temporary rough patch with Moni because we had been fighting and arguing and I needed someone to be there for me and he couldn't be that. He couldn't be there for me. I needed my friends for that. But now I feel ashamed and embarrassed to interact with them because of my behaviors and so This just put me in such a shitty position and it was really hard to climb out of and it fucking sucked and I hated it and I I really don't want it to happen again. So what do we do to combat this 
How do we keep shame from taking over the control panel and just, you know, driving us into the wall? Which, guys, when I say taking over the control panel, I really hope that some of y'all are laughing and y'all are getting the reference that that is to Inside Out 2. If you haven't seen Inside Out or the second one, you got to fucking see them. They are so incredible. They are teaching emotions. It's meant for kids, but y'all, us millennials, we grew up not le- <laughs> not being taught about emotions, so it's great for us to... Uh, so good. So those of you who have seen both of them and understand it, thank you for catching my reference. I appreciate it. <laughs> Anyways, how do we combat this? Back on track. So I found an article on the Gottman Institute's website, which is titled How to Deal with Shame. And it is written by Anna Aslayan, who is an M who's a, excuse me, she's a LMFT, which is a licensed marriage and family therapist. In her article, she said, here's the truth about shame. The less you talk about it with someone safe, the more control it has over your life and your psychological well-being. The fear behind shame is usually the belief that sharing your story and being who you are will make people think less of you. It fights against the human need for acceptance. So, the best answer on how to combat, combat, <laughs> on how to combat shame is to talk about it, and specifically talking about things that make us feel shame with someone safe. Don't go talk about it to the town gossip who's going to go just run their mouth to everybody, or someone who's just going to beat you down, or not empathize with you. Talk about it with someone safe. So I know from experience that that is not easy. Uh, I have had to learn how to talk about shame myself. And as we can see, I still struggle. (laughs) So this article actually recommends seeking help with talking about shame through therapy, which I can attest works wonders on helping to identify shame and allowing you the opportunity to be able to process it in a safe environment. So that is something that I have done with my therapist for years. It has definitely, definitely helped. And it's, of course, something we're still working on. But another answer that I have on how we can combat shame, which is a much cheaper option, and especially for those who are not in the position to pay for therapy right now, is to read Brene Brown's book, Braving the Wilderness. So on YouTube, you see the cover right here. Um, I am going to put a link to the book in the show notes for those of you who are interested in purchasing a copy and checking it out. Um, I also recommend checking out your local library because the first time I read this book, it was at the library. The second time I read this book, well, actually, I'm about to start reading it again, I should say. (laughs) But I actually found this at Goodwill for $1.99, y'all. Oh, my God. I found two other Brene Brown books, too. It was the best. Actually, I'm going to put the picture in the show notes. It was the best damn Goodwill haul ever. I found 10 10 good books. Almost all were psychology except for three. Well, four. And that being one Harry Potter book that I'm going to sell because it's a first edition that I am going to make a bit of cash off of. And the other three are all of the Fifty Shades of Grey books, which I was wanting to read. So we got a little off topic, but that was exciting. I love Goodwill. I love used things. I love Brene Brown books. And if you're on YouTube, This is in pristine condition, literally pristine condition, and I paid $2 for it. Ah, gotta love it. So the reason that I recommend this book is that my therapist recommended this book, and of all the Brene Brown books, she said that I should read this one first. I fully agree with that. I'm actually going to put the link. I wrote an article about, um, I ranked all of her books in order of most valuable, right? And this definitely was number one on the list because this book changed my life. I'm going to read the back of it to you really quick. Braving the Wilderness, and on the front it says, The Quest for True Belonging and the Courage to Stand Alone. 
So on the back, it says, true belonging doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. So true belonging is not about fitting in, pretending, or making the people around us comfortable because that's safer. The four practices of true belonging require us to be vulnerable, to get uncomfortable, and to learn how to be with people without sacrificing who we are and what we value. Each practice challenges how we think about ourselves, show up with one another, and find our way back to courage and connection. So those challenges are that people are hard to hate up close, move in, speak truth to bullshit, be civil, hold hands with strangers, and a strong back, soft front, and wild heart. So true belonging and self-worth are not goods. We don't negotiate their value with the world. The truth about who we are lives in our heart. Our call to courage is to protect our wild heart against constant evaluation, especially our own. So to sum all of that up and to make it make a little more sense, this book is going to teach you about self-acceptance. And self-acceptance is really one of the biggest ways to combat shame. If you are confident in who you are and you love you yourself for who you are and you're happy with who you are as a person, it's going to be a lot harder to feel shame. And I know that because, like I said, I've overcome areas of shame. Social status is an area of shame. Holy shit, y'all. I am not a college-educated person. I'm currently working towards my associate's degree. But I don't have a college education currently. I don't have one finished, I should should say. I have, I grew up in a lower middle class family. I didn't get to wear all of the nice fancy clothes growing up like all the other rich kids in town did. I felt a lot of shame around social status, even up until my mid-20s. Because again, college education and career. I went on dates with guys when I was still dating who judged me for not having a college degree who judged me for being an office manager in the medical field. I felt shame around those things, which now I have no shame in terms of social status. Like that area I have completely been able to overcome and I am proud of myself for that. I am so proud of myself because I've worked hard. But that's the thing. It's what you have to work at this. And I still struggle with body image. I still sometimes struggle with relationships. We've talked about that. So there are areas of shame that I still need to work on. But it's self-acceptance in those areas that's actually going to combat the shame. I'm not working on the shame. I'm working on accepting myself so that shame can't creep in and take over like it tries to. And this book, This book will help tremendously. It's 160 pages. It's an easy read. And it's also so incredibly life-changing. You're not going to want to stop reading it. I finished it very quickly because it truly changed my life. And I hope that if you're in a place where you need it, that you will read it. Because I guarantee you it's going to help you too. So another thing that I'm going to suggest towards self-acceptance in order to combat shame is to work on self-acceptance through exercises. So I don't have any handy right now. I do know, actually, I do have one handy right now, which is you stand in front of the mirror and you tell yourself that you love, you say, I love you in the mirror to yourself every day. You say it every day until you actually start to mean it and then you keep it up. Now, It's going to feel silly and it sounds silly and it's something that I actually am about to start practicing myself, but it's a way of loving yourself. You say, I love you to your husband, to your wife, to your boyfriend, to your mom, to your dog, to your kids. Why don't you say that to yourself? Before you can love all those people, you have to love yourself first and that's part of self-acceptance. So, That is one exercise. I'm going to add two more exercises, so a total of three, in the show notes and little things that you can do to work towards self-acceptance, to work towards loving yourself more. Because again, that's going to help combat this shame and it's going to help to keep the shame wizard out. 
And I hope you get that reference too. I'm not telling you what it is. I just hope that you get it. <laughs> and if you do get it and you're on YouTube, drop a comment. I want to hear about it. <laughs> so also guys, even if you already have a strong sense of self-acceptance, it's important to keep nurturing it so that it stays with you. Keep practicing and do not shy away from it. It's like learning a language or, I don't know, riding a bike. <laughs> you have to practice it or else you'll lose it. So lastly, to wrap this episode up, I want to remind you that shame does not define you. Your courage to rise above it does. Your courage to take action to not let it affect you and to love yourself instead is what actually defines you. So take a moment today to embrace yourself, to embrace how much you love yourself, to embrace the goodness within you, and to let go of any of the shame that no longer serves you. You are more powerful than you know, and it's time to step into that power with confidence and with grace. So keep moving forward. Your journey to self-acceptance starts now. Win of the week. Win of the week. Okay, so we're briefly going to do a win of the week because we're already pumped up to 40 minutes, (laughs) close to it, something like that. So this is a segment where we are going to spread some positivity. We have a lot of really hard, deep conversations on this podcast, so I like to end on a positive note. So this is also an opportunity for you to receive a shout out. If you have any wins that you want to share, whether you you know got the dream job you've been waiting for, you bought a new house, or you showered for the first time in three days. No win is too small for Distress to Joyful Bailey's Way, and I want to cheer you on and celebrate alongside you. While I'm waiting for you guys to write to me, which I'm waiting ever so patiently, I am going to share my win with you. And I have been holding on to this for a while because I've been waiting to receive back the photos, (laughs) but I won first place in a fashion design competition back in April of this year. And it's so exciting. It's FGI, which is Fashion Group International, and it's the Dallas chapter. And this is prestigious. This is huge, huge. It's great for my portfolio. It will hopefully help me get into my next university of choice to further my education. And I'm so fucking proud of myself. I'm so proud of myself. It was the sustainability category. I'm going to post photos on the... Uh, excuse me, in the show notes, I'll eventually put photos on my Instagram as well. So be on the lookout for that. I'm not going to describe it to you. That's going to take way too much work. So I'll put some description of it in the show notes. Plus, you want to see it. You really want to see it. You don't want to hear me describe what I fucking made. That's boring. Go look at it. (laughs) So yeah, I'm excited and pat on my back because this is huge. So What is your recent win that you want to share? Head on over to whatishaybalesdoing.com slash win of the week where you can submit your win anonymously if you'd like. You can also include your name there. It's totally up to you. Or you can send me a DM on Instagram at distressed to joyful underscore Bailey's way. And I would love to hear from you. Let's shout you out. Let's spread some positivity, y'all. In the next episode, we are going to talk about exercise and bipolar disorder. And I am pumped to talk to you about this one because exercise has changed my life. It can change your life too. And I'm going to get some more research into that because I know from experience that it works. But like, why? What's really going on here? Let's talk deep. Let's dive into it and let's explore some new information, some new ideas and 
some new lifestyle changes that you may consider if you aren't already doing it. (laughs) So thank you for tuning in to today's episode. But until next time, take it easy, stay grateful, and be joyful. Bye! Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Distressed to Joyful Bailey's Way. Head on over to whatishaybellsdoing.com to find the resources mentioned throughout this episode. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram at Distressed to Joyful underscore Bailey's Way and on Facebook at Distressed to Joyful Bailey's Way. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating on your favorite podcast listening platform or write a review on Audible or Apple Podcasts. Lastly, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with new episode releases. Until next time, take it easy, stay grateful, and be joyful. Bye!